On April 10th, 2015, Professor Kamal Kirshi, Director of the Center on the United States and Europe's Turkey Project at the Brookings Institute, gave a talk entitled Turkey's Quest for Influence in International Governments. This talk was given under the auspices of the Center for the Study of the Middle East and was co-sponsored by the Inter-Asian Iraq National Resource Center and the Turkish Student Organization. Thank you, Professor Istrabadi. It's really a genuinely honor for me to be here. I spent a good part of my uh, career as a university professor, and this actually physical setup, as well as the presence of you here, looks uh, very familiar and makes me somewhat nostalgic about the, uh, the good days. And I, I also agree with Professor Istrabadi that it's exciting to be in, a, in, a, in an environment where the emphasis is to work on policy-oriented uh, projects. This is an experience that I had never really had before. Uh, Turkey is not a country where politicians and uh, rulers feel that they need to go and consult with, uh, uh, with uh, ac uh, academics. Uh, so it, it is a, a feeling that you know, helps with your ego a little bit. <clears throat> I hope I will be able to live up to the good words that you've uh, just uh, uh, spared for me. What I intend to do is to look at Turkish foreign policy. Uh, oh, no, this is not the one I'm supposed to press. I am technologically somewhat uh, limited. There you go. Uh, let me just say a very quick few words about what we do at uh, at Brookings on on Turkey. That's I think the uh, the pointer for. That's the pointer. Yeah, yeah. Then the, yeah. the, the oh, that works. Yes. You see. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So, forward and back. Yeah. And if you need technological advice from me, <laughs> you, are, <laughs> you are in deep challenge. You know, on, on on the flight from Washington D.C. here. Uh, I happened to sit right next to a lady who had been flying with United Airlines as, an, as a captain, as a pilot, for 30, 33 years. And it was a fascinating discussion we had, and I learned greatly uh, from that discussion. Uh, but I was telling her I really miss technology from the 60s and the <laughs> 70s when these, these gadgets did, uh, did not exist. At Brookings, since I arrived in, uh, in uh, January 2013, I have basically been working on uh, three major projects. Uh, one project, as soon as I arrived, was uh, looking at how Turkey might be able to accede to the transatlantic trade and investment par partnership. Uh, for reasons I won't go into the details, but is very much linked to the presentation I'm going to uh, give. I, we also worked on the Syrian displacement <coughs> crisis and published a number of uh, reports uh, uh, on that topic. And thirdly, we're just at the moment working on uh, uh, regional security in uh, the South Caucasus. We were particularly interested in uh, the topic given uh, the uh, the special meaning of 2015 this year uh, for the Armenians around, uh, around the world and revisit that particular uh, episode uh, from the perspective of to, uh, to, uh, today. Uh, I have also been doing very recent work and a report of mine will be uh, published very, very soon on a very recent development in EU-Turkish relations that makes this particular topic here very relevant. Both sides, that is the European Commission and the Turkish government, have agreed to upgrade Turkey's customs union with the European Union. Uh, many of you may have not been aware of this, might not have even picked this up. But from where I stand, this is of huge strategic significance, almost at the level of what happened in the late 40s when Turkey was incorporated 
into the uh, transatlantic uh, alliance. And it's from there that I'd like to uh, uh, start. <coughs> My argument is that Turkey has long been a solid uh, member of the uh, transatlantic alliance, especially since the beginning of the Cold War, that is late 40s, early early 50s, even if there were ups and downs in that r relationship. I will not go into the details of it, but if there is interest, we could uh, uh, address it. Part of this thesis runs very much counter to what the general attitude and belief in Turkey has been towards this relationship, towards Turkey's solid presence in the transatlantic alliance. However, this is fast changing in, uh, in Turkey. The recognition, contrary to general belief in Turkey, the recognition that Turkey has benefited from being a member of this transatlantic alliance, thank you very much, very generously. And I think that becomes even more striking in the light of what has been happening in Turkey's neighborhood and the chaos that has uh, surrounded it. The counterfactual question that I'd like to leave with you to, to support this position is, imagine where Turkey would be today had Turkey not been part of uh, that solid uh, alliance. I will uh, go back into some details uh, there. But from 2009, roughly, this is a symbolic date, and it's a date that takes on the one minute incident that took place in Davos during the World Economic Forum when the, uh, uh, the former prime minister, but the current president of Turkey, wiggled at, uh, a finger at the Israeli president, Shimon Peres, over uh, Israeli uh, operations into, Gaza, into the Gaza Strip and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the consequences the uh, civilian suffering resulting from, uh, from that. Uh, from then on, Turkey began to drift away. And uh, uh, the current picture of Turkey right now, especially if you could go back to the way in which the, the crisis over Kobani was, uh, uh, was, uh, 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 was covered in the media, uh, Turkey was very much seen as a culprit of this chaos and very much in uh, following conflicts, in conf uh, following policies in conflict with the West and particularly the US, for example, over foreign fighters and uh, ISIS's finance, uh, finances. Uh, the thesis then ends that today, because of the chaos reigning, Turkey is quietly awkwardly trying to make its way back into uh, the, the fold. And I will argue that this is especially driven by economic considerations, even if the, uh, uh, the ideology part of it may be pushing things in a different, uh, different di direction there. Uh, very quickly, a few words about Turkey's place in uh, the uh, in the alliance. Uh, when uh, when uh, people are uh, excited and become frustrated about <coughs> Turkey, and I can uh, empathize and relate to that frustration to a large extent, they tend to overlook that Turkey has been part of uh, what you could call post Second World War or Cold War institutions from the very first day and was founder of some of those in, uh, institutions. For example, the Council of Europe going back to 1949, but was also part of uh, the predecessor to WTO, the World uh, Trade, Trade or Organizations, not to mention, of course, NATO membership. So Turkey has these deep institutional relationships with this transatlantic community that many other countries in the neighborhood uh, uh, in the neighborhood uh, uh, lack. The second point is that Turkey during the Cold War was what you would call a frontline state, a little bit like it is today, a frontline state 
uh, from where the dangers to the uh, to the transatlantic community uh, emanates from. What is interesting about that period is these these statistics uh, here. These are difficult statistics to uh, to find. These are public opinion poll results from a 1965 poll that was taken in Istanbul and in Ankara. You could argue that they may not be very representative of uh, the country at large, but nevertheless they are very telling as far as, uh, as, far as that public opinion uh, goes there. That unlike today, uh, the, uh, the public in Turkey at the time was deeply pro-Western, pro-US, pro-NATO, uh, pro if uh, you go into the details of it. I mean, an approval rate of 78% for NATO, I think you were not going to find it in any other NATO member country today. today. I, I think the, the context of the time needs to be borne in mind but I'm sharing these, uh, these, uh, these public opinion results to give you an idea of the mood and the degree to which Turkey was uh, integrated into that transatlantic uh, community. When uh, the Cold War came to an end and the 1990s uh, started, uh, I was just in the early years of my career. And I, I recall the panic in academic um, media, informed media circles, but also in the Turkish foreign ministry that Turkey was losing its strategic significance from the West and that it, it was going to be left out in the cold in this new world and fail to benefit from the peace dividends that was supposed to accrue from the end of uh, the, uh, the Cold War. Yet, the way in which the post-Cold War uh, period uh, unfolded in the 1990s, you saw a uh, Turkey that became a constructive partner in many of uh, the UN, but also NATO-led peacekeeping and peacemaking operations uh, in, uh, in the Balkans, but sometimes beyond the Balkans as, as well. Yet this was also a period when uh, uh, some analysts, at least, saw Turkey as a security consumer because of its policies in northern Iraq, because, ironically, its policies towards Israel, as to, I'm, I'm sorry, towards Syria, as well as uh, I, uh, Iran. Uh, Turkey had threatened war with uh, Syria, it had uh, threatened Iran with military intervention as well. Uh, and it had almost gone to war with Greece over the Imea Kardak Islands in the Aegean uh, Sea. So a, a kind of a mixed record uh, in the 1990s as well as far as foreign policy goes, but nevertheless still part of that transatlantic uh, co uh, uh, co community. In the 2000s, with the European Union's engagement of Turkey and uh, the kind of uh, political reforms that was put into place in uh, the expectation and belief that Turkey would eventually become a member of the European uh, <coughs> Union, uh, you saw uh, a, a Turkish foreign policy that is captured by this slogan, zero problems with neighbors. We're going to revisit that, uh, uh, that slogan. But it is a foreign policy that began to address bilateral conflicts in the region and attempt to resolve them. The most significant and striking one being the uh, decision to support the United Nations Anan plan on the island of Cyprus, aiming to reunify the uh, uh, the island. You know, when I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, saying these things, it really sounds banal, but it was a revolutionary change in Turkish foreign policy, and a change that very much 
changed perceptions of Turkey from being a security consumer to a provider of uh, security in, uh, uh, in, the re in the region. This was also a period when uh, uh, Turkey's economic growth attracted attention. This is a period that I called Turkey became a trading state, a state whose uh, foreign policy is trying to resolve conflicts, but also create a neighborhood open to economic, uh, economic integration. And there, I would argue, considerable uh, credit goes to the uh, current prime minister of Turkey, Ahmet Davutoglu, uh, when he served as a first as a senior senior advisor to the then prime minister and then subsequently the uh, minister of foreign affairs and when you examine the details of this policy as well as the rhetorics the language the discourse behind it uh, someone like myself who held the uh, Jean Monnet chair couldn't couldn't help but but detect elements of Jean Monnet's thinking as, as far as European integration goes. For those of you who may not be f that familiar with Jean Monnet, Jean Monnet was a personality that is considered as, as at least one of the most important founding fathers of the European integration project when he argued that after the Second World War, the way to reconcile this worn, torn Europe was to encourage free movement of goods, uh, capital, uh, and people and services. And I, am, I would argue until I bore you to death that European integration was successful in that sense. And it's very sad that these days that we tend to forget and overlook that success because of the difficulties that European Union is going through these days. And uh, uh, the minister Davutoglu adopted language along those lines, for example, in 2009, 2010, when he was advocating the idea of free movement of goods and people from the city of Kars. Those of you who are into heavy literature and are familiar with Orhan Pamuk's uh, write, uh, writings, I've never managed, I have to confess, even though I'm being recorded, that I've never managed to read the whole <laughs> book. It's a bit <laughs> on the heavy uh, going side. But Kars is the city right next to Armenia today, and he argued from this city all the way to the Atlantic uh, Ocean, a huge geography in which economics would unfold a little bit like it did in, uh, in Europe to integrate and bring about peace and stability in, uh, in this uh, region. Policies were introduced that was called Shamgen, to rhyme with Schengen. Again, those of you are familiar, Schengen regime is the regime that ensures free movement of people within uh, Europe across uh, bor uh, borders of European member uh, uh, countries and he did push for it uh, in the Middle East. There was already a, f a similar arrangement for uh, the uh, post-Soviet uh, geography there. And this is these are the developments and policies that had made Turkey a model for uh, the Middle East and beyond, especially at the time when the Arab Spring first uh, occurred. However, this did not last very long, and this process of what I call drifting away started. Uh, um, I take this particular incident as a reference point. Uh, I have had an opportunity and uh, the, the chance to talk to some of the people who were, who were behind the scene when it happened. And I understand that it came as a surprise to people who were behind the scene. It was a very unexpected development. It wasn't in the books. It had not been prearranged. And rightly or wrongly, I think about this 
as the point at which foreign policy, Turkish foreign policy, becomes a domestic political consumption item okay, to, to boost uh, the prospects of the political party and leaders in power. It came, uh, it came shortly before local elections in Turkey. And as a political scientist, you can't help but think <coughs> or detect a relationship uh, uh, there. In the benefit of time, I'd like to rush you through a number of, uh, of selective developments that re has reinforced this notion of drifting away as a, in many ways as a reward for Turkey's uh, successful policies, especially foreign policy up to this particular date. Turkey was elected as a member, as a non-permanent member of the United Nations Security Council with an overwhelming yes majority for the first time, watch this, since 1961. So this is politically very significant and I think you can take it as a measure of how popular and how uh, well received <coughs> Turkey and Turkish foreign policy was. And this particular observation becomes even more telling when you look at the way in which uh, Turkey failed to be elected into the United Nations Security Council last fall. It was a very embarrassing experience. Uh, many wise people tried to discourage the government from running as a, uh, as a candidate for membership for uh, the United uh, Nations Security Council, but they insisted and uh, the outcome was uh, very um, uh, embarrassing there. While member of the, uh, of the uh, Security Council, Turkey voted against a, a resolution put forward by the United States and the West together with uh, Brazil and that was seen as a sign, as a very solid sign of uh, Turkey drifting away. And this was very quickly followed by the Mavi Marmara incident. Again, you may not be familiar, but this was a Turkish uh, ship with many civilians on board trying to bring humanitarian assistance to the Gaza Strip uh, by breaking the Israeli Israeli blockade of the Gaza Strip. The ship was intercepted by uh, Israeli uh, Navy and uh, the outcome was uh, a number of civilians were, uh, were killed. Uh, I think there was outrage uh, internationally, but the problem was the manner in which the aftermath of the Mavi Marmara crisis was handled. Uh, particularly on the uh, on the Turkish side. Very quickly, another uh, uh, manifestation of drifting away uh, came in the context of the post-Arab Spring. That is, with post-Arab Spring, I mean the uh, uh, the way in which the prospects of of reform of transformation very quickly died away, and uh, the the Spring turned into uh, into so in a, a very nasty uh, winter uh, there. And in that <coughs> context, uh, Turkey adopted a discourse that uh, became deeply critical, deeply critical, but at the same time very anti-Western on, uh, uh, on Egypt, on Syria, on uh, Iraq, and on uh, Libya. And uh, uh, as, as, uh, uh, as uh, Turkey became increasingly isolated in uh, the context of developments in the Middle East, this notion of precious loneliness was introduced. The idea that Turkey is holding the upper ground, the moral ground, the ethical ground by uh, defending uh, the side that was overthrown in Egypt by the military and very critical of the double standards in uh, the West uh, that was supporting the uh, military uh, government there. Same very critical uh, 
position on Syria and on this reluctance to remove Assad from uh, power. Uh, similar observations can be uh, made on Iraq uh, as well as, uh, as Libya. One final point I'd like to rush in is also the way in which the then Prime Minister began to toy with the idea of, uh, of becoming a member of first the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, that is the organization that brings together countries like Russia and China, countries that have a very different understanding of how countries should be run and how economies should be managed, taking the form in November 2013 when the Prime Minister was visiting uh, Russia for uh, the annual bilateral summit where he asked from uh, Putin uh, very publicly, the President of Russia, that if he would make it possible for Turkey to join his economic union, Turkey would be prepared to dump its European Union uh, membership uh, saga the way it was uh, called. Now, very quickly, why did this happen? Why did this drift away take, uh, take place? <coughs> Domestic politics is very critical. Domestic political developments. In 2007 and 2011 parliamentary elections, the governing political party uh, uh, obtained very successful results, very unequivocal results in terms of the popularity of uh, the, uh, uh, the government. Uh, this, is, this also became an occasion when uh, the then foreign minister would begin to put into practice his vision for Turkish foreign policy, a vision that was elaborated in 700 pages in a book called Strategic uh, uh, Debt. Uh, Debt. It's a fascinating book. It's a very detailed uh, book. Uh, however, the, the, some people have highlighted that this book has never really gone to, through an academic refereeing uh, pr uh, pr uh, process. The, the, uh, the, uh, the book, in, an, in a nutshell, and uh, this will probably not do justice to the book, but in a nutshell, takes a very critical view of traditional Turkish foreign policy. Uh, it accuses, it criticizes traditional Turkish foreign policy of remaining aloof to a geography in which Turkey enjoys strategic depth through, through history, through ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, uh, allegiances, but also cultural and religious uh, common denominators. So this is roughly a geography that covers the Middle East, parts of the, uh, the Balkans, and maybe extends into uh, Central, uh, Central Asia. And uh, the point about the book is, is the argument that Turkey has to take a proactive policy and become involved in these geographies in efforts to shape that, uh, that geography. And at one point, though it's not in the book, it became even more ambitious and put forward the idea that Turkey is now, with its economy at the time booming, uh, almost growing at the rate of uh, China, Turkey uh, should be a order setting country. This is very ambitious, an order setting country. I think this conceptual framework uh, played an important role in, uh, a play, uh, I would argue, that helps one to understand the degree to which Turkey became involved, especially in, uh, in the Middle East. But there is also a domestic political dimension to it. Uh, as you would uh, imagine, in a country like Turkey, the notion that Turkey is regional power and maybe even a global power uh, is a very well-received message. Uh, 
coming on the heels of a, of a well-established socialization process that draws this picture that Turkey has been a victim of uh, you know, Western imperialism, of efforts to weaken Turkey, and that the, the, the place of Turkey in the transatlantic community that I have made reference to as, uh, is presented as one that has, uh, that has undermined Turkey's interests and that Turkey at best was economically uh, exploited. Now, if you've been socialized into this I, 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 uh, idea, into this line of thinking, the idea that Turkey is a regional power, is a global power, is clearly a, a, a message that wins you votes and wins you uh, sympathies. A second important development that could ex help to explain this, uh, this uh, drifting away is the 2008 crisis, financial and economic crisis in, uh, uh, in the West, the way in which European Union economies began to shrink, including the United States, and at a time when Turkey and the emerging countries' economies were expanding. And it also coincides with a time when there's a booming literature on the rise of the rest and the decline of the West. So the temptation is to become part of that uh, rest. And uh, if you're interested, you can go into academic literature on Turkish foreign policy, and you will see quite a few articles and publications coming out on trying to determine if Turkey could qualify or would qualify as an emerging country and join the so-called BRICS, if a T could be squeezed in <laughs> to some uh, somewhere. Yet what is fascinating about that literature for those of you who like to follow academic literature is in the way in which some uh, solid articles have also highlighted the, highlighted the reality how what differs Turkey from the others, the BRICS, meaning Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, is precisely the way in which Turkey is deeply integrated into uh, the transatlantic ins uh, institutions uh, 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 there. But beating the West would uh, make capital. And I saw many uh, instances where this was done. And it was done at times in a rather uh, I can't find a polite word for it, but in, in, a, in, a, in a rather crude manner. And one manifestation of it came in 2011 or 12, when the minister responsible for EU affairs, and one of those ministers who uh, became implicated in the corruption scandal of December 2013, and eventually lost uh, his uh, position in the cabinet, and now looks like will not be able to run in the elections in, in June, uh, on one occasion said that Turkey did not need the European Union's membership, uh, the European Union could go to hell, uh, but that if the European Union was interested to become a member of a successful, economically successful Turkish Republic, it could apply for membership and that the application would uh, be given serious uh, consideration. <laughs> this occurred at a time when in a similar setting like this, in a TV program when uh, one very otherwise respectable professor of constitutional law in front of a you know, TV audience took the uh, <coughs> uh, progress report of the European Commission, the European Commission every year prepares a report on how far uh, Turkey's harmonization of its uh, laws and uh, regulations with the European Union's acquis has uh, progressed, a report, and took the report in front of that audience and simply threw it into the dust uh, bin or the trash <laughs> bin. Now, obviously, for 
domestic political reasons, this can go down well, but in the long run, it has its uh, ramification as, uh, as well. And I share these as signs of how this West and rest, uh, this decline of West and the rise of uh, the rest uh, ha uh, manifested itself in, uh, in, the, in the country. Very quickly, the, uh, the other uh, why is uh, captured in some of the observations I've already made uh, on, uh, uh, on, on an earlier uh, occasion here. Uh, think about it, the way I could maybe best capture it in just a few words is, is that, is that there, w there was a kind of a pull-push mechanism involving Turkey in its na uh, neighborhood. The push part was driven partly from domestic political aspirations, but also from uh, economic realities. Here is an economy that is, that is uh, uh, you know, functioning very dynamically, and it wants to export, it wants to, uh, in, it wants to invest. People are coming and investing in the country, picking up jobs, just like Turkish workers in the 60s and 70s would go to Germany to pick up jobs and send remittances. People from uh, neighboring countries were coming to take up jobs and send those remittances. So it's moving in both directions. And Turkey's uh, uh, successful zero problems uh, policy also was creating demand. Uh, 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 we need to bear that in mind as, uh, as, as well. The debacle, uh, very, uh, very quickly, I, was, uh, I, I have, I think, 40 minutes, and I'm already up 30 minutes. So uh, please warn me when I'm beginning to go beyond uh, this audience patience. Uh, the debacle, that is, when did things began to go wrong? I think things began to go wrong, it's difficult to uh, maybe put a date. Maybe August 2013 is a good date. It's a date when uh, there's chemical weapons that have been used in uh, Syria. Uh, the Obama administration uh, had declared that that would be a red line for an American intervention and a Turkish government that had taken it very seriously. And uh, the failure of the American uh, administration to follow up on, on that promise or perceived promise, uh, uh, I think was a turning point where Turkey became more deeply involved in Syria with, with the hope that it might be able to make a difference. And making a difference there is really bringing uh, the Assad regime to an end. How are you going to do it? You could do it by military intervention. That was a, a very clear no-no. A very clear no-no reflected in uh, public opinion surveys. This is a survey by a small Turkish think tank with uh, some respectable standing. And in May, June, when they were asked whether Turkey should have a military intervention there or not, uh, uh, you know, 41%, a very important chunk, said no. And then in a, 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 another important group was saying no military, try the diplomatic, diplomatic line, the very line that the government was failing to follow. By the time you come to September, that is only a few uh, months uh, later, try to recall the developments uh, during that period. Those advocating that there should be no involvement in uh, Syria whatsoever, whether military or internal affairs, meaning you know, supporting parties there against it, had, uh, had grown. So you, you're really running against the public opinion at a time when it is also becoming clear that the regime there is not going to go away within a very short uh, period of, uh, of time. <coughs> the second point, beside this huge incongruence between reality uh, as well as public opinion and the uh, policy, the second point is uh, 
a failure to appreciate the complexity of the situation in Syria. This is very ironic. It's very ironic because the very people whom I would argue made this mistake were also the very people who were begging to the United States uh, not to become involved in Iraq in 2003. The number of meetings that I set in 2004, 2005, partly some military, some more academics and uh, di uh, diplomats, where you could hear personalities who had personally appealed on uh, their US counterpart not to get involved in Iraq because there would be very unexpected consequences, etc., were taking a similar position in Syria, uh, going in there with the belief that it would be a very straightforward, a la, if I dare say, a la George Bush, fix Iraq, you fix Syria as well. We, without, this is really fascinating, and I, I, I think at some point a PhD could be written uh, about it. How come you can make such mistakes? And how come when you are arguing that you are a country of importance in the neighborhood and you know the neighborhood and you fail to understand that Iran and Russia are going to in get involved in there and that the game is going to change very dramatically and no way you as Turkey, you're going to be able to field the kind of resources that Russia and Iran are able to afford. Not that Turkey doesn't have resources. The key here is to afford those uh, uh, re uh, resources there. And uh, in, in the case of this uh, particular point, it's not that Turkish bureaucracy didn't raise these challenges. It's not that the media did not raise these <coughs> challenges. It's just that it fell on deaf ears, I'm afraid, the way it fell on deaf ears here in the United States too in 2002-2003. A third uh, point, and uh, the academic literature on this point is just beginning to emerge and flourish, is the role that <coughs> political identity and religious issues, religious identity, uh, played in uh, Turkish foreign policy. Uh, Turkish foreign policy makers uh, adamantly, vehemently, categorically always argued and denied that their involvement in uh, the Middle East, in Syria, in Egypt, in Libya, were driven by either neo-Ottomanist or by religious considerations. They vehemently denied that. However, the perception increasingly became one where Turkey became a player in the sectarianization of the conflict in Syria, in uh, Iraq, especially Syria. And uh, more and more, I mean, for someone like myself who has studied Turkish foreign policy for a good 30 years now, it's very baffling to see the term Sunniization of Turkish foreign policy. It's a term that I had never come across, never uh, heard of, but it is a term that is now appearing in uh, academic uh, lit uh, literature uh, there. Lastly, finally, uh, the uh, zero problems with neighbors uh, became no neighbors without problems. <laughs> uh, this is a fascinating label. I haven't invented it. It, it is in uh, in uh, it first appeared in the uh, in the media. I have certain names. I won't pronounce them. I wouldn't want to get them into difficulty uh, into difficulties. But this is the idea that here is a country that was capable of bringing Israel and Syria to almost direct talks, very close to it. And this is 2008, December. And maybe this explains also the one minute, the frustration that you're hosting the Prime Minister of Israel, I think at the time, Ehud Olmer, 
for a private dinner where you are left with the conviction that the prime minister has accepted the idea of direct talks with Assad to address the conflict between Israel and uh, uh, Syria. Can you imagine what the world would have looked like had that occurred? Instead, five days later, this operation against the Gaza Strip was launched, and the then prime minister, to me, it's not surprising that uh, you know he went through the uh, through the roof, and that's really the beginning of the end of this otherwise quite close uh, relationship with uh, with Israel there. But that Turkey, a Turkey that could talk to the Syrians and to the C Israelis, and that could almost bring them to direct talks, and the Turkey that was able to talk to the Sunnis uh, in 2005 to encourage them to enter the elections in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq had become a Turkey that did not have an ambassador in Cairo, in Tel Aviv, in, uh, uh, in uh, Baghdad, and uh, long-standing no ambassadors in uh, Cyprus and in, uh, in Armenia uh, as well. And this turn is supposed to capture this disappointing reality out, uh, out there. Signaling the change of course. The debacle has, uh, has occurred. And uh, I argue that what has been missed out in uh, maybe in the US to a lesser extent in the European Union is that, that without admitting it, there is a recognition at the government level that this is what has happened. And that Turkey has to readjust itself to uh, the realities and readdress its relationship with the transatlantic economy, even if its heart may not be uh, there. And soon after his election as president of Turkey, uh, the current president declared 2014 as the EU year. Now, you know, you, many of you, I suspect, are political science, science students. Declarations are cheap. But beyond declarations, if you are mobilizing a bureaucracy, all right, if you are mobilizing top-level bureaucrats to produce elements of such a policy, then inevitably that goes beyond just a declaration. And the fruits of that engagement were about to be picked in December last year. We held a conference in Istanbul. Uh, as part of my job there, I run what is called as uh, the Turkey Policy Paper Series. And the very last one was a paper by a very good friend and colleague who now serves as the advisor to advisor special advisor to Frederica Mongherini. How many of you know Frederica Mongherini? Well, good. Frederica Mongherini is the current foreign minister of uh, the European Union, to put it in a very uh, simple way. The person that Henry Kissinger would have uh, wanted to call back in 1970s when he mockingly said, what is the phone number do I call in when I need to talk with the European Union about foreign, uh, foreign, uh, foreign affairs? She prepared the paper. We launched it. And the deputy foreign minister of Italy was there. And the deputy minister of the European Union Affairs Minister of Turkey was there too. And although it was not openly said, it was clear that the European Union, two weeks later, was going to open the 17th chapter of uh, the negotiations. Now, 17 chapters for you would mean nothing. But if I was to tell you that that's the very chapter that Nicolas Sarkozy was blocking because he considered that the negotiation of that chapter to amount and to mean to symbolize that Turkey's membership to the European Union is serious. Right? 
So this is for December. What happened in December, mid-December? All hell was let loose in Turkey when these two former allies fell into a vicious war. And the government went ahead and began to arrest journalists belonging to their former uh, ally. And uh, Frederica Mongherini, who had, she had met the president only a week, 10 days earlier, and had said that members' uh, relationship with, you, with Turkey had, had strategic significance, turned around and said, this is unacceptable. And the president, in his usual populist way, successfully calculating the mathematics of uh, uh, votes, <laughs> told her basically to take a walk, di diplomatically put. And they suspended the chapter. They didn't open it. So uh, you know, there's a declaration. It may be hello, but there was a lot of work uh, be, uh, behind it. I have to rush. Uh, there's been long-standing interest that was expressed at Brookings in April 2014 by the Minister of uh, Economy wanting to make Turkey part of TTIP. This is what I have spent the last two years. And uh, please don't challenge me. I would go into it until you regret it. <laughs> A lot of that. And I, I think it was driven by genuine interest in becoming part, uh, part uh, of it. There's bureaucratic level economic dialogue that's going on, but there's also a very slow and painful change of course on Syria that is starting to get picked up by the uh, media as well. Time limits me. I won't go into the uh, de uh, details of it. Though there is a very muted response to Russia gobbling up Crimea and the Tatars that live there, and the Tatars have a very important ethnic connection to uh, Turkey beside being Sunnis, for, uh, for that matter. In spite of the muted response to all this, uh, there are very interesting developments in the Black Sea as far as uh, NATO operations and as far as these unheard gains that go on uh, uh, with uh, with, uh, with Russia. I will spare you the details. The details are supposed to be unknown. <coughs> Why? Why is a little bit Napoleon's famous line, money, money, money. It's economy, it's economy. And it's economy because of this reason. I don't know how far you like tables, but what this figure here is saying, compared to this figure when I was a university student at Boğaziçi University, it says that Turkey's foreign trade is equivalent to 50% of Turkey's GDP. It means that Turks or people in Turkey live off from foreign trade. In my time, this was insignificant. In my time, wearing a pair of jeans on my campus was a sign of prestige because jeans didn't exist in, uh, in, in, in Turkey. And the ref refrigerators you would buy be hidden behind uh, tariffs, import substitution uh, e economy, uh, would burst, the ice box would burst within a month or two because of its poor quality of it. That's the reason, 49, and there too I, I, I could go into uh, great uh, de uh, details of it. Uh, a second factor is the gradual return of the West. I mean, give, I suspect there might be some Republicans here, but give the president some credit. <laughs> the American economy is coming back. And that reality is uh, in contrast with the difficulties that emerging countries are experiencing, including, including Turkey. So that is changing the earlier calculus I made references to. Thirdly, Turkey remains deeply integrated into the transatlantic economy, very deeply. I have a series of 
pie charts that I'm going to rush through to give you an idea what that means. Now, this is Turkish foreign trade last year. And this whole part of it is with Western economies. You could add to it this bit as well, and it would bring you somewhere here. So I would argue that that deep economic relationship with Western countries, some of them members of the transatlantic community, is a critical factor there. This is also reflected bitterly in foreign direct investment. If we could go back to that first table there, that 49.2% is very much related to this, and uh, plus the, the US here, which means that a lot of, a lot of the money, all right, uh, a lot of the technology, the capital that drives Turkish exports and foreign trade is capital that is coming from, uh, uh, from uh, the transatlantic community. The same applies to Turkish capital. This may be news to you, but in this country, there are people who take paychecks home because there are Turkish companies that have invested here. One good example is Borusan in, in Texas, and then a cable company in uh, New Jersey. Where do they go? Well, they, they mostly go to, uh, oh, sorry, to, again, Western countries. Look at Russia. The president loves Russia. And his right-hand advisor yesterday or the day before in Washington, <coughs> D.C., advocated deeper relations with Russia. But why isn't Turkish capital going? Arriving visitors to Turkey, overwhelmingly from the West, though Russia is very critical there, uh, there too. And now I'd like to show you this table. And this table in itself, I'm tempted to argue, explains why there's an effort to change course. Exports, that's what brings money to Turkey. That's what brings employment to, uh, to Turkey. To Egypt, between 2012 and 14, fell by 10%. And the Egyptian government has, uh, has refused to renew the uh, agreement that allows Turkish trucks to be transported on roll-in, roll roll-off ships to the Suez Canal and then onto, uh, uh, onto Saudi and Gulf, uh, Gulf uh, markets. Turkish investments in, uh, in uh, Egypt are coming back because of the uh, foul political uh, reasons. Look at Russia, Ukraine, but exports to an ailing European Union is going up. Uh, exports to the United States is going up. Very embarrassing. Exports to Israel is, is topping. And what is more painful is that Turkish exports to Israel equals in value to half of Turkish exports to huge Russia. That speaks for, uh, for itself. And on the flight here, I've been reading a book on, uh, a, a great book on uh, the Euro Euro-Asian Customs Union and uh, the consequences of that on Turkish exports to the Customs Union area is going to make things even more com uh, complicated. Public opinion is changing too. Public opinion that was pro 73% in the good old days came down to 38%. Uh, it's not surprising that it happened that year. And since then, it's gone up to 53. But this is even more striking. 49% of Turkish public opinion have said that not NATO is essential to Turkish defense. It's not surprising. 
given what's happening in the Middle East and what's happening in, in the North. And when you put these factors together, I think you arrive to a situation where the government is trying to readjust course. And these are my concluding uh, remarks. This warming up Turkey is a title that the, uh, the uh, person who runs is really interesting blog at Brookings called Order from Chaos blog. And we are all duty bound to contribute to it. And in my contribution, I tried to summarize as best as I could. It was still too long and the, uh, the person who runs it had to massage it and put this, <laughs> this title to it. And what the title says is that Turkey is sending the signal and the West has to respond to it. And uh, it has to respond to it in a similar way like in the late 40s. In the late 40s, the United States responded to Turkey on geographical grounds. It was the geography of Turkey that was important strategically next to the Soviet Union. Today, it continues to be geographically important. It speaks for itself. But additionally, Turkey has an economy, meaning that it can bring jobs to the European Union and to the uh, United uh, States. So as Turkey is trying to rechart its foreign policy, US leadership is very critical. US, U.S. leadership was critical in 47, 48. It was very critical in 1991. Not many people in this country know that the customs union that was negotiated and concluded between Turkey and the European Union in 1995 uh, enjoyed the helping hand of Clinton's ambassador in Brussels called Stuart Eisenstein. And Stuart Eisenstadt was invited to an event on the 18th of February at Brookings. You can go and look it up and read the transcripts on the Turkish economy that I organized, where we discussed a World Bank report from December on the Turkish economy and what Turkey needs to do to upgrade its economy and come out of what they call middle, tra middle income trap. What the report did not mention was the need for an external anchor. And in that, in that conference, this is what we discussed. And we discussed the idea of the upgrading of the customs union. And Stuart Eisenstadt, who now is, is I think, in, in his mid, if not late 70s, made a brilliant speech reflecting what I think is a very classic American understanding of geostrategy and geopolitics. And in that context, he said that leadership is uh, needed there. And it's needed for a very specific reason. The European Union, to start negotiations with Turkey to upgrade the customs union, has to give a mandate to the European Commission just like it gave a mandate to the European Commission to negotiate with the United States the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. To get that mandate, the Commission needs unanimity. And there is one country that is likely to stick the spanner in the wheels. And there is only one country that can convince that state that is being courted by Russia. It's not Greece. Uh, Greece is very supportive of this uh, pro uh, process. Uh, is being courted by Russia. And uh, being courted by Russia has very important geostrategic significance to the huge disadvantage of the transatlantic uh, community. And that leadership is called for right, uh, right now. 
The economic ties to the transatlantic community, I've already indirectly covered this. I'll spare you uh, the, uh, the details of it. And I shall conclude by saying that uh, beyond the offensive language and populistic language that gets sometimes employed by the Turkish leadership, there is also the reality that Turkey as a long-standing member of the transatlantic community has legitimate grievances. And at least some of those grievances need to be addressed. And that's where also the US can play a role. And uh, by playing this role, it will, it will bring on board a country that can, can eventually play again a constructive role in the search for order from the chaos that reigns in that neighborhood. Thank you and thanks for your patience.